Three Lives Three Worlds The Pillow Book Upper Volume Original Work by Tanki Gongzi English Translation, Hamster 428 English Editing, Rock Harlequin, Joanna Kuang Chapter 10 Fengju didn't see Donghua again in the ensuing days. At first she wondered if she had ruined his plans, and was sure he was going to punish her for it. Even while resting from her cold, she came up with countermeasures should she see him again. But for several days, the school didn't schedule Donghua for another lecture. One afternoon after class ended, she paid close attention to Princess Jialuo who had always expressed great interest in Donghua, but the only thing she heard from her was a few grumbles to their fellow classmates that he hadn't come to teach. Nothing else of value was mentioned. Donghua came here to see Jihan. Now that they'd seen each other, perhaps he had gone back to Jukongtian. But if he loved her, why didn't he just take her away from this place? Why wait every ten years to meet? Was this possibly one of the new hobbies he discovered during these past few hundred years? During the years she wasn't with him, Donghua had indeed become increasingly confounding. Today, Meng Xiao invited her and Xiao Yan to Ziwalixian, a famous restaurant in the capital, for drinks. Ziwalixian had recently acquired the most beautiful dancer in the entire city. Meng Xiao watched her with great delight. Then, sloshed after a few drinks, he had let spill the secret of the four pythons guarding the Saha tree. But Meng Xiao's speech, not unlike his essays, had never been articulate. The secrets he spoke of were muddled and disorganized. Thanks to Xiao Yan's ability to succinctly summarize things, they were able to conclude that on the 15th of each month, the pythons left their pillars to absorb mystical essence from heaven and earth, and thus for a few hours, there would be no one to guard the magical tree. Should they try their luck during this gap? Opportunely, there was a full moon that very night, and there was no better time to act. One never knew, maybe the magical fruit would be hers tonight. Listening to Feng Ju, Xiao Yan was led to believe this year's Saha fruit could also make a man out of someone apart from the unprofitable uses he already knew. He gladly joined in. To begin, he connected an underground passage from beyond the city walls to the GU Spring. Playing the hero, he even volunteered to explore the path in advance. Fengju had felt a teeny tiny bit guilty before Xiao Yan so heroically jumped down that pitch black tunnel. After a long time, he did not come back. It would be ridiculous for warrior Xiao Yan to be devoured by mystical energy-sucking pythons. But he was ultimately a demonic lord who had committed many misdeeds in the past. What if heaven was punishing him this time? She stared into the bottomless abyss, squeezed her eyes, and jumped down as well. Sky Cavern this meaningful term was used to signify that at the end of a dark cavern there was to be a blue sky. The passageway Xiao Yan created for some reason became a three-legged intersection. Before she knew what to do, she fell to the bottom of one of these paths. Xiao Yan said the tunnel he made connected to the Jiayu Spring. Once she exited the tunnel, it should lead straight the spring where she would be met with water instead of air. This was why Fengju had gone as far as to ask Meng Xiao for a water pearl beforehand. At this time, however, the cavern she fell into was an enormous space. Above her head were howling wind and storming cloud. Below was an endless green forest swaying in the blasting wind. She hugged herself close as she stood atop a canopy. 
this wasn't the aquatic world Xiao Yan had spoken of. Was she lost? Had Xiao Yan, who had gone out to explore and hadn't returned, also gotten lost? Bravo, he had made the secret passage himself and still got lost. What a genius! The demon clan must be a more charitable place than common belief for Xiao Yan to retain his throne through all this time. Feng Ju hid herself among the verdure while massaging her bruised shoulder. A blood-colored moon hung low at the far end of the horizon. Such scenery was surely sinister. She had most likely fallen to a forbidden, demonic land somewhere. Xiao Yan remained on her mind. While she was debating whether to look for him here or to turn back and look for him at the spring, a string of laughter suddenly reverberated at the end of the forest. It must be a beautiful young demoness, Feng Ju thought, for her laughter was rather grating to the ears. Not having seen a demon in years, she wanted to at least sneak a peek before leaving this place. So she slid away down, pressed herself against the leaves, and looked out toward the sound of the laughter. Coming into her sight at the end of the flower path was a purple-robed deity sitting in lotus position, his sword placed by his side. Why, wasn't this Dong Hua Daijun whom she hadn't seen for several days? What was he doing here? With his eyes closed, he had seemed to be meditating. As she was about to move in closer for a better look, a pair of smooth ivory arms snaked to his shoulders and slowly inched their way down around his waist. An alluring face emerged on his shoulder. Her ebony hair entwined with his silvery one, her smile as elegant as an orchid. Your Grace, you only come once every ten years. Do you know how much I've missed you, or how agonizingly I've waited for you? Her honeyed words flitted to Feng Ju's ears. Sitting atop the tree bough, she lost her hold and carelessly fell to the ground. The girl's enticing eyes swept in her direction, and with her bare arms still encircling Dong Hua's neck, she laughed, Is there anyone in the world who's as bad at romancing as you? How can you bring along two other women on a rendezvous with me? Aren't you afraid I'd be saddened? It was quite breezy out here, why were his garments so thin? As Feng Ju pondered on this, she averted her gaze and realized the girl's meaning when she said too. It turned out there was someone else who had been standing under the tree for a while now Princess Jihun in her fluttering white dress. Today, not only was the princess's dress the color of snow, her expression, too, was frosty white. She looked to Dong Hua, her lips forming a closed line, on her face was a pained expression. Feng Ju felt sorry for her. Luckily, Dong Hua chose to open his eyes at this exact moment. A strong gust shook the forest and a flurry of petals came raining down. Within the flower rain, Dong Hua furrowed his brow toward the young ladies and asked, Why have you come here? Not the two of you, just you. Feng Ju scratched her head trying to think of an answer while Jai Han woefully spoke up behind her, Teacher, I was worried for you. I had such a difficult time finding my way here, but you're... I, Feng Ju quietly comprehended the scenario. So Dong Hua was asking Jai Hun. She brushed her nose and raised her ears to listen, waiting for Jai Hun to continue. As she waited, she took notice of the flying petals in the air. They resembled the holy fulling flowers from Jukongti and she once liked best, but these shouldn't be growing at this foul place. Jai Hun still hadn't said a thing more. Feng Ju lifted her eyes to look at her. The demoness had audaciously pressed her face to Dong Hua now, 
and the king was showing no intention of moving away. Jai Hun finally couldn't seem to take any more of this, and with her hands curled into fists, she turned and ran. The demoness who had her hands around Dong Hua was still smiling from the corner of her eyes. She said to Feng Ju, This young lady is different from her sister, she didn't run away from an intriguing scene. You want to stay around to witness my love making to the king. Feng Ju dug around for a while before finding her Dozhu's sword. She raised her head and returned the temptress's bright smile with one of her own. Be my guest. I see no harm in standing around to watch. With her head rested on Dong Hua's shoulder, the demoness's expression instantly changed. Her laughter ceased as she lowered her voice, Have you seen through it? She then sneered, Very well. If you want to wade through this muddy water, I shall grant you your wish. In an instant, she had leapt several paces back. A red damask sash shot forward, this was a move aimed for the vital neck area. Only a moment ago, Feng Ju was still debating whether or not she should meddle in this affair. When she first saw the pair through thick foliage, she too, had wondered since when Dong Hua had fallen for that beautiful enchantress. At the same time, she also wondered how it had been possible for him to love Jai Hun while simultaneously have affection for someone else. Did such a love exist in the world? How complicated, this thing called love. She often did not understand it. Not until she inadvertently gazed up and saw turbulent clouds rolling in and the moon alternating from white to crimson did she suddenly perceive the situation. There had to be strong opposing forces between these two for this strange phenomenon to occur. Jai Hun ran away in jealousy because she hadn't noticed that in spite of Dong Hua and the demoness seeming intimacy, there existed a hidden struggle between the two. Dong Hua was so handsome that it was possible that the demoness truly did harbor feelings for him. On the other hand, he left her to her wiles perhaps so that Jai Hun and Feng Ju would leave this pernicious battleground. Feng Ju reckoned he had been worried for her and the princess. Suddenly, he seemed kind and noble to her. It was different had she not recognized his kindness but how could she leave him behind when he had been so honorable? Vile spirits practiced vile sorceries. Among them, seduction was one of the most dreadful. The more beautiful a temptress was, the easier she could beguile her victims. It mattered not if one was a god or a demon. As long as there was worldly longing in one's heart, it was easy to be entrapped. Although Dong Hua had phenomenal cultivation, he did harbor feelings for Jai Hun. And among the six emotions, love was always first. It was difficult to guess what the consequences would be if the demoness were to use her seduction power on him, Feng Ju's presence here could only help in part. She sighed once again. Why hadn't Jai Hun seen this? If she had there would be an extra helping hand, and they'd have a higher chance at winning. Women. They were always so sentimental. Feng Ju reckoned her situational analysis today was exceptionally swift. Her movements, too, were swift. In the midst of flying fullings, her long blade moved like flashes of light. They had been fighting for a while but the demoness's damask sash had yet to touch her body. Feng Ju was quite happy with her display today. Dong Hua leaned on his palm as he watched Feng Ju flit and fly like a white butterfly in the petal rain. This was the first time he saw her complete sword dance. It was said her swordsmanship was learned from her father Bai Yi. If he remembered correctly, Bai Yi's swordsmanship was known for its tenacity. 
but she had demonstrated it much more gently. Each movement was exquisitely graceful, her composure and poise were also quite good. To be able to duel against Miao Luo, who was created from the Huiming realm, at her age and cultivation could be seen as a rarity. Truthfully, Feng Zhu had not guessed incorrectly at first. The purpose of Dong Hua's trip this time had been to quell evil. This girl wasn't an ordinary demon, however. She was a manifestation of the three toxins seeping from the Miao I Huiming realm. Once this manifestation came to being, His Majesty the King himself would need to be troubled. Nonetheless, Dong Hua had trapped the original essence in the Huiming mirrored world. Every ten years, a small amount of toxin escaped out and drifted down to the living world. She was more powerful than ordinary demons, but was yet a cause of concern for Dong Hua. He hadn't intended to let the demoness close to him to chase Jai Hun and Feng Ju away for their own safety. The closer the demon was to him, the easier she could use her seduction power. But the closer she was to him, the easier he could also destroy her. There was really no need to push her away. Feng Ju misunderstood that he had acted for her and Jai Hun's sake, and was even touched by that small gesture. Nonetheless, it was still a hostile environment. Although Miao Luo was only a manifestation of the true form, she was still an imposing threat compared to Feng Ju and Jai Hun. It was natural they should be afraid of her. He didn't know why Jai Hun was here, but she had recognized the danger and ran away, it seemed she was tolerably smart. In his impression, Feng Ju was clearly smarter than Jai Hun. One might think she would slip away even before the princess, but for some reason she had stayed instead. He studied her for a while and began to doubt himself. For a moment, he couldn't discern whether the white-robed girl in the sword stance protecting him was the same Feng Ju he knew. But although it was hidden, he could clearly see her phoenix flower mark, and it was very real. Her sparkling eyes were also the same familiar image he knew from Zhu Kongtian. Did she really think he was manipulated by the enchantress and wanted to save him? Dong Hua leaned on his palm and quietly looked at Feng Ju who was standing with her sword in hand. Since the day he was born from the Blue Sea and climbed the Mountain of Skeletons until now, there were numerous of those who came to ask for his protection, but he never thought there would be someone who wanted to protect him. Protection mentioned alongside his name was but a laughable jest. But right here right now within the petal rain, the fragile young queen from King Kaiho was fencing her thin blade against a much more formidable monster to protect him. This was certainly an interesting surprise for Dai Jun. When Feng Ju drew her sword for the second time, she realized her chances of winning against the demoness were very slim. She stayed behind to help him, but that had been the extent of her intention. She was only planning to prolong enough time for Dong Hua to find a chance to act. She hadn't thought to take the task of killing Miao Luo away from Dong Hua's hands. In the first half of their battle, Feng Ju felt she had defended rather well. In the following half, she dearly hoped Dong Hua could quickly leave his seat and lend her a hand. When she gazed toward him, Dai Jun was leaning on his palm and looking at her with a bright gleam in his eyes. She vaguely saw three syllables forming on his moving lips. Feng Ju pondered in silence. Between the first and second and second and third syllable were mystical pauses. Perhaps it contained a sublime meaning, and would help her swordsmanship rapidly improve. But the wind was screeching too loudly with each of her blade swing. What exactly were the three profound words he said? 
Only until the damask sash clawed onto her shoulder did she finally get it. Be careful, he had said. Luckily, the sash was fast but it wasn't very forceful. It only managed to cut a piece of her silk dress. She was able to fend off the next strike with her sword. As Feng Ju fended off her opponent's attack, she thought of the strong force coming from the Miao Luo's red sash just now. It was about to knock away her sword when for some reason, the energy weakened substantially. She took her chance and struck back, pushing Miao Luo two paces backward. When had her swordsmanship become so phenomenal? After the demoness regained her footing, she all of a sudden looked past Feng Ju with a strange smile. In that split second, Feng Ju realized that during their fight, the two of them had moved to within a dozen paces of where Dong Hua was sitting. Miao Luo was clearly smiling to Dong Hua. She hadn't time to think by the time her body had already reacted as she plunged to the back. This time, sure enough, the five red damask sashes flew at Dong Hua like five electric serpents. Feng Ju shielded Dong Hua's body as the two of them were thrown several meters off. Instantly, the seat where he sat was obliterated by the red damask sashes. She sweated cold sweat and thought to herself how dangerous it had been. While pressing against Dong Hua, she realized why he hadn't jumped in to help her throughout this time. It was likely because he was placed under the demoness sorcery and couldn't move. Fortunately for him, she was feeling kind-hearted today and decided to stay and help him. She didn't know what would happen to him otherwise. She was always sympathetic toward the wretched. Thinking that Dong Hua rarely fell into such dilemma, she gently returned his gaze without feeling any abashment looking into his eyes. Her heart for some reason was brimming with sympathy. Really, she had misunderstood him a bit too. Much all this while. Dong Hua Daijun hadn't done a thing entirely because he wanted to see how far she could actually go to save him. The damask sashes were wielded by Miao Luo like a living thing. Not hitting its target, it immediately changed direction and rushed toward the two of them again. If that bundle of electricity were to hit her, she'd certainly vomit blood. It was quite easy to duck by herself, but to take the paralyzed Dong Hua along. While she was contemplating this difficult decision, she felt her body being rolled along on the ground to dodge the sash's attacks. Before she could waste her own energy, she was already lifted up by the wind. Her sword-holding hand was held by another, and so was her waist. Dong Hua spoke to her in a low voice from behind, look closely. She widened her eyes as her body moved forward, the lustrous blade surging like swirling snow. She couldn't see where Dong Hua was taking her or what move he was using with her Dozua sword. When her vision returned, the only things she saw were fragments of red damask flying in the sky. The blade's shiny end was bleeding, pierced in the center of a wide-eyed Miao Luo's forehead. Feng Ju had always deemed herself an experienced immortal. Although she hadn't demolished many demons herself, she had witnessed her uncles and aunt many times throughout the years. She hadn't seen any demon as wicked as Miao Luo, yet Dai Jun demolished her cleanly with only one strike of the sword. She suddenly felt a newfound admiration for his capability. Dong Hua extracted the Dozua sword and returned it to its scabbard. Falling petals scattered in the forest like falling snowflakes. They drifted further and further away until they completely vanished. From time to time, a few fell onto her hand, but she couldn't feel them. She then realized the phantom sea of flowers she saw was merely an illusion created by the demon. 
wind screeched loudly in the dense forest. Smoke started to rise from Miao Luo's feet, it was a sign of her impending death. Her spurned eyes dilated white as she faced Dong Hua smirkingly. I've always heard of your grace's unparalleled tranquility in all the realms. I've long wanted to know if your heart is truly as placid as they say it is. My wish was at last granted. Her cold eyes flickered a shrewd flash as if she had seen a laughable joke. I didn't know your grace's weakness is a sea of falling flowers. How interesting, how interesting indeed. I wonder if what you keep in your heart is this flower sea, or a certain someone hidden inside it. She cackled twice more, the most powerful deity in the world the so-called saint who has reached single-mindedness in the nine mental abidings having this shocking of a secret. Interesting, interesting, and, she hadn't completed her last word when it dissolved along with her body into smoky thin air. Feng Ju stared wide-eyed at Miao Luo's last words and stared wide-eyed again as she watched the demoness evaporate into thin smoke. She thought this was going to be a once-in-a-lifetime battle. Dong Hua couldn't help her, but demolishing a monster wasn't an everyday opportunity. Her excitement had only just begun to fuel, but, had everything already ended? The dissipating smoke gave way to a breezy moonlit sky. Feng Ju was getting suspicious. Only a second ago. Dong Hua was sitting like a wooden statue. How could he come in at that critical moment with such calm? Had he fooled her again? She silently admired her calm acceptance of this fact. She'd been fooled so many times she was growing accustomed to it. Feng Ju carelessly shortened her sword down to the length of her palm and buried it back into her sleeve. Then, she casually turned around and cast a goodbye nod toward Dong Hua. Why did she stay just to be righteous when she knew she wasn't good enough? Now he was going to laugh at her again. Never mind, she'd be the bigger person this time and gift this act of honor to him for free. As she stepped away under that breezy clear sky, Dong Hua asked her in his unhurried way, Why have you come here? This question sounded a little familiar. Feng Ju tilted her head a while, then skeptically pointed to herself and responded, You were asking me. The moon began to hide itself behind the clouds. Dai Jun simply looked back at her, Do I look like I'm talking to myself? Feng Ju kept the surprised look on her face and pointed to herself again. I meant that when I fell from the tree and you asked Princess Jihan, why did you come here, you actually intended the question for me. Dong Hua waved his hand and conjured up a low, long divan. He sat down and raised his head to her questioningly. If not, then who do you think I was asking? Upon seeing her confused look, he repeated, you still haven't answered me. Why did you come here? Dong Hua's repeated question sparked a memory in her chaotic mind. She was supposed to steal the Saha fruit tonight, but she had somehow gotten excited once she had drawn her sword, and in the end forgot her original purpose. She suddenly perspired at the thought of the amount of time she had lost. She replied him perfunctorily, I just happened to be taking a walk. When I saw that you were bullied, I just happened to help you out again. Little did I know I was being fooled. She picked up her pace and walked away. Dong Hua's voice unhurriedly carried on behind her, You're leaving without taking me along. Feng Ju turned around. Why should I take you along? Dong Hua didn't follow her. Instead, he leisurely remained on his divan. When he saw her turn around, he casually answered, I'm injured. 
Can you leave me here and be at ease? Yes, Feng Ju nodded candidly. Very much so, she impetuously added when she saw Dong Hua's raised brow. At this time, her forward marching feet for some reason started to stumble backwards on their own. Before long, she was brought next to the divan where Dong Hua was leisurely lounging on. She held onto the bed frame in annoyance. You. It seems you're not that at ease. Feng Ju couldn't utter one word. Dai Jun's mastery of shamelessness had gotten even better in the few days they hadn't seen each other. She reined her temper in with what rationality she still had left and softened her tone. Pardon me for my ignorance. You seem so comfortable. I really can't see where exactly your royal body is injured. A soft breeze fluttered the sleeve of Dong Hua's robe. There was indeed a long gash on his right arm where warm blood was now gushing from. It wasn't there a moment ago, perhaps it had been covered by the garment's dark hue. She was told Dong Hua had never bled since the day he reigned the universe. It was a rarity to be able to see him bleed from an injury like this. She stepped closer to him and remarked in excitement, There's a gold pigment in the red color, how appropriate for being your majesty's blood. From what I read, a bowl of this blood is worth 1,800 years of immortal cultivation. I wonder if this is true. Dong Hua raised a brow at her and let out a sigh. Normally in this scenario, your first thought should be on how to stop my bleeding. Feng Ju's excitement hadn't receded. She quickly replied, even though I'm not considered a beauty yet, give me another 10,000 years and I'll definitely acquire that status. Among my aunt's stack of screenplays, none has said the hero would intentionally show his weakness to the beauty after rescuing her. You must have an ulterior motive in showing me your wound. It isn't as if this is the first time you've lied to me. I bet this injury is merely an I'm asking sorcery, do you think I'm stupid? Dong Hua gazed to his wound, then back at Feng Ju. After a second, he softened his voice, you are getting smarter these days. Except your childhood teacher never taught you the most basic lesson in sorcery. I'm asking magic involving blood can only fool humans, it cannot fool the immortals. Feng Ju had never heard Dong Hua speak this much. His words sort of made sense. She staggered back in momentary fright. Then, this wound is real. She stepped forward again skeptically. Blood was indeed still dizzyingly gushing out. She promptly tore off a piece of her skirt to stop the flow as she doubtfully murmured, But there are many heroes I know, my uncle-in-law for example, no matter how grave his injuries are, he always tries his best to hide them from my aunt. My father, too, never lets mother know of his injuries. Even the flamboyant Jian quietly hides from little uncle whenever he gets hurt. But your action is something I've never quite encountered. Dong Hua casually watched her as she clumsily wrapped his wound and patiently explained to her, Ah, that's because compared to them, I'm a weak hero. At this time, Feng Ju sat on the divan Dong Hua had sat on a minute ago. She rested her right hand on the bed frame as she endured the weight of Dai Jun's head. In other words, Dong Hua was presently resting his head on her precious lap. How did things turn out this way? Feng Ju had scratched her head for half a day and still didn't quite know. In half a teacup's time, she had repaid Dong Hua's misdeed with kindness. After she had bandaged his arm, she bid him goodbye and left for her own affairs. Dong Hua didn't keep her this time. When she followed the path in her memory to go back, however, 
she couldn't find the spot where she first fell to. Her acumen served her well in this time of need as she realized Dong Hua must have had something to do with this. She furiously turned back to look for him. Before she reached the reposing king, he had already said to her, I forgot to tell you. Twelve hours after the demon perished, this place would automatically lock up. I'm afraid you won't be able to leave. As Feng Ju stood bewildered, Dong Hua continued, You have something important to attend to. Feng Ju replied miserably, I have a previous engagement with Yan Chai Wu, as she was about to add to go to Jiayu stream and steal the Saha fruit. She at once caught herself and said instead, for something. A moment ago, she had wondered whether she had been too nice to Dong Hua, but now her goodness proved to be a sort of luck. Instead of taking advantage of his affliction, she even helped bandage his injury. In only a couple of steps, she rushed to Dong Hua's side and held his injured arm up to show him the proof of her kindness earnestly asking him, Dai Jun, don't you think I've dressed your wound rather well? Don't you think you owe me one this time and that you should repay the favor? He fixed his gaze on her. There's nothing special about this bandaging. How do you want me to repay you? She held onto his arm even tighter. It's really simple. There's a life and death matter I must go to. This place can trap a crummy fairy like myself, but it certainly cannot keep someone as great as you. If you will help me get out of here, I'll forget both the times you left me in Fanyan Valley for six months and when you pretended to turn into the silk handkerchief. What do you think? Dong Hua continued to gaze at her with his piercing eyes. Why do I have a feeling that you hold an especially long grudge against me? How patient she could be sometimes in important situations. Even when Dong Hua's gaze was boring down on her like this, she felt no major perturbation. How can that be? She replied as sincerely as she could. Receiving no reaction from Dong Hua, she paused then added, it's because you're the only one who always aggravates me. How about Yan Chai Wu? She heard Dong Hua ask. Xiao Yan was pretty stupid, Feng Ju thought to herself. He was lucky she didn't bully him. It'd be the world's biggest phenomenon since the creation of heaven and earth if he were to dare harass her. Nonetheless, Xiao Yan was still a lord of the demon clan. As friends, she shouldn't humiliate him. Xiao Yan? Er, Xiao Yan's pretty nice, she answered vaguely. But that sort of vague answer had sounded half hearted at best. When Dong Hua remained quiet and closed his eyes to rest, Feng Ju thought she had trailed off topic. She quickly returned to the matter at hand, let's. Place aside whether or not I hold a grudge for now. This attitude of yours, are you going to help me or not? Dong Hua remained close-eyed, his eyelashes casting a lush shadow. At long last, he retorted, why should I help you leave so you can go see Yan Chai Wu? He was trying to pick a fight with her, she was sure but she knew Dong Hua had always preferred malleability over rigidity. She suppressed her anxiety and replied ever so eloquently, I helped you out because we are fellow fairies. Since I've helped you, you should help me back. That's the way of the honorable. If he was going to reply in his unreasonable way and say something such as, I don't feel honorable today. I don't want to help you, she would so claw him for his trouble. Unexpectedly, Dong Hua opened his eyes and fixed them on her a while. Then he flatly told her, I have no way of taking you out of here. 
It doesn't matter how urgent your date with Yan Chai Wu is, you'll have to wait another 12 hours. Feng Ju's head exploded. Then I'll definitely miss our appointment. She placed all her hopes on Dong Hua's almighty powers. She didn't think she'd really be stuck here and lose her time at stealing the Saha fruit. Dong Hua didn't look as if he was joking either. He said nothing more afterward. Feng Ju sat stumped for a spell. When she gazed up, the starry sky no longer held any moonlight. The forest leaves rustled in the wind. If she lost her chances today, she'd have to wait until April 15th, which was one whole month from now. Feng Ju tiredly slid down from the low divan and slumped onto the ground. The bright starlit sky suddenly began to pour. She started and jumped back onto the bed. Like a curtain of continuous pearl strands, heavy rain enveloped the thick forest. In this dark night, it had seemed as though a spiteful hand was pouring water straight from the heavenly stream down onto them. The divan was the only dry shelter free from the rainfall. She had heard that when powerful demons were demolished, sometimes it was easy for the lingering foul energy in the air to gather again. It was thus necessary to wash every trace of foulness with rainwater for 49 hours. Only then can the extermination be completed. This rain, then, was likely summoned by Dong Hua. Night rain always brought about sentimentality. What was that quiet thoughts by the lantern light, raindrops bring sorrow in the night and the like, as all descriptions often were. The rain heightened Feng Ju's own sadness. While Dong Hua seemed as though he was lying idly, she knew he was actually using the rainwater to wash away lingering foulness from Miao Luo. This was why he had made a bed, to keep dry and to rest knowing he would be stuck for an amount of time. Dong Hua was always meticulous. Feng Ju dolefully sat on the bed and accepted she had lost her duck due to this rain. She was so sure the Saha fruit would be hers tonight, but somehow this had to happen. Fate was really inescapable. In any case, it was she who pulled Xiao Yan along, was he going to fall for it again on the next full moon? It gave her a headache just thinking about this. Feng Ju began to think up possible excuses so that Xiao Yan wouldn't be mad at her. She couldn't tell him the truth. He already hated Dong Hua so much, but instead of stabbing Dong Hua a couple of times in his stead, she left him to rescue Dong Hua. This was akin to betraying their friendship. Air. Should she tell him she was lost in the valley's forbidden land and was held captive by a monster for the entire night? This story was fairly sound except if she was going to go with such pretext, she'd need to fabricate another lie about how she eventually escaped. This part was slightly more problematic. Then unwittingly, she babbled out loud, none of these excuses is going to work. Scamming is an art in itself, especially if I'm going to scam Xiao Yan, who always picks flight over fight. Air. Dong Hua's eyes remained closed, he seemed to have no reaction, but the downpour became heavier all of a sudden. It hammered down on the forest like a frightening army. Feng Ju started and nudged over toward Dong Hua. She felt calmer when her feet reached Dong Hua's leg. At this time the king suddenly spoke, I didn't know you are this worried for Yan Chai Wu. Dai Jun had a way of saying perplexing things. She knew his ambiguous speaking style, but shouldn't he in this instant at least say something like scamming people requires careful thoughts? It seems you should work harder at raising your intelligence or the likes. Momentarily not knowing what to say, Feng Ju for some reason blurted, 
I'm worried Xiao Yan won't help me steal the Saha fruit on next month's full moon. The moment her words left her mouth, her face turned pale as she hastened to correct herself. Actually, what I mean. The rain softened considerably. Raindrops flowed down the clear wall of the force field. Behind the water cascade was a hazy image of Dai Jun leisurely lounging on the divan, his long silver hair spilled on the bed like yards of satiny silk. Feng Ju blankly watched Dai Jun's reflection on the force field's wall. Stealing wasn't a proud exercise to begin with. On top of that, she was shouldering King Kaiyu's reputation as the kingdom's sovereign. If Dong Hua repeated this story to the Bianiao queen, or worse yet, her parents, she'd be as good as dead. She opened her mouth wanting to say a couple of salvaging lines but her wit was failing her in the most dire situation. Finally, Dong Hua spoke first. His voice was noticeably gentler, you're meeting Yan Chai Wu tonight so you can steal the Saha fruit. Feng Ju laughed nervously and shifted toward the back of the bed. No, no, absolutely not. How can I, as the Queen of King Kaiyu, do something as disgraceful as stealing? Haha, <laughs> you heard wrong. Dong Hua clutched his head and sat up. Feng Ju anxiously watched him rub his temple as he continued in the same gentle voice, Ah, I might have misheard then. I have a slight headache, can you let me lean on you? Her hair braid was being fondled. Dong Hua's every move stirred the heartstrings inside her. She at once offered graciously, It won't be comfortable leaning on me. Let me conjure up a cushion for you. Her thoughtfulness was targeted wrongly. Dong Hua started to rub his temple. Again. Something is coming back to me, did you say at next month's full moon? Quickly understood, she promptly scooted over, held his head, and pressed it onto her lap. Are you comfortable like this? Or should I lie down for you to rest on? Would you be more comfortable if I lie face up or face down? Once he was comfortable with a position on her lap, he opened his eyes and said, Are you more comfortable sitting or lying? Feng Ju imagined lying down for a second, if they were to lie down. Sitting is more comfortable, she swiftly said. Dong Hua closed his eyes again. Then let's do that. Watching a sleeping Dong Hua, Feng Ju recalled the days when she had also once liked sleeping on his lap as a baby fox. In those days when falling petals fell on her head, Dong Hua would brush them away for her. Afterward he'd even stroke her soft fluffy fur. At those times, she would take her chance to lick his hand back, she let out a sigh as the memories halted to a stop. How funny life worked out, it was now his turn to rest on her lap. If Dong Hua kept lying this way for twelve more hours, she'd have to buy some medicine to treat her numbness. Lost in her own wandering thoughts, it was Dong Hua's voice that brought her back, My hand is feeling cold, likely from the loss of blood. Since you don't have anything to do, do you mind keeping me warm? Feng Ju stared at his raised hand for a long time before she replied, Men and women should keep their distance, Dong Hua idly mused, After tonight, I plan to meet the Bianiao queen and ask her how to grow the Saha fruit. Do you think I should? Feng Ju at once took his right hand that was supposedly growing cold from the loss of blood and said in all seriousness, Distance smish tance. That's the silliest rule the moralists ever came up with. She took his hand and held it with care. Are your majesty pleased with the warmth I'm giving your hand? Dai Jun was naturally well pleased. He serenely closed his eyes again. 
I'm a bit tired, I want to sleep. Make yourself comfortable. How in the world was she supposed to be comfortable in this situation? Was he telling her to push his precious head and hand to the ground? As his breathing became more even, she couldn't help herself and bent down to make a face at him, mumbling all the while, you only sat there watching in amusement from beginning to end, and you have the nerves to say you're tired and sleepy? I'm battle-torn but I still have to serve you. I'm more exhausted. She only dared to whisper her words. He didn't see her, he didn't hear her, but it was enough to release her frustration. Incidentally, her stray hair hung loose and grazed his ears. Before she could raise her head, Dong Hua suddenly opened his eyes. He looked at her for a length of time with a smile in his eyes. Did you say I was only sitting by to watch? He paused and watched her innocent face. What do you mean I only sat to watch? I clearly sat by and very seriously, with nary a trace of pudency, he capped off his sentence, cheered you on. The next morning when Feng Ju roused from her dream and recalled the events of the previous night, there were three questions she could not answer. First, the wound on Dong Hua's right hand had come about too suspiciously. She didn't believe it had occurred because she had fallen on him as a result of Miao Luo's attack. She could still remember he had held her tightly in his arm and the action with which the blade had stabbed through Miao Luo had been decisively swift. There was nothing which had seemed out of the ordinary. Second, Dong Hua's attitude toward her had always been puzzling, but since she was too occupied with the situation at hand, she didn't have time to think about it. Honestly speaking, it was wholly within reason to believe that because Dai Jun must absolutely stay for twelve hours to purge the monster's foul spirit, he didn't mind sacrificing his own arm to keep her with him so that he wouldn't become bored. But was the bored king that absurd? All right, so he was definitely a very bored, and very absurd sort of person no matter how one looked at him. But could he really be that? Bored? That absurd? She shouldn't think so poorly of Dai Jun this way. After a bit more mulling, she dropped the matter altogether. In reality, her rationalization was entirely correct. The third question, Feng Ju recognized right away her familiar bed and soft quilt at Jai Feng Yuan. On a corner of the quilt were several embroidered peonies which she had butchered into daisies when she was practicing her stitching the other night. She remembered falling asleep to the lingering sound of residual rain along with Dong Hua's even breathing. Behind that curtain of rain, the sky had been lit with stars. She had felt warm because she was forced to hold Dong Hua's hand. His body had also emitted warmth. She had gradually lowered herself onto his precious head and fell asleep. She clearly remembered leaning against Dong Hua's divan. She was cold at first, but it became warmer and warmer as her sleep went on. For that reason, she slept soundly and remained dormant for an unknown length of time. But why did she wake up in her own room at this moment? Bundled in her blanket, she wondered if everything had been but a Huang Liang dream. It was the 15th, and she had gone out for drinks with Meng Xiao and Xiao Yan. The girls were beautiful, the wine intoxicating, and she had been knocked out until now. Because of her rich imagination, she was able to dream up such a realistic dream. This was a possibility. As she was about to step down to go wash her face, Xiao Yan lifted the curtain and walked in. Feng Ju couldn't control her eyes from twitching. Xiao Yan's outfit was very unique today. On top, 
his silk shirt was red, on bottom, his shiny trousers were barley green. Draped on his shoulder was a shawl just as glossy and green as his trousers. He looked exactly like a giant carrot freshly pulled out from the snow. The giant carrot woefully looked at Fengju. Someone took a liking to this compound and told me to move out. I've already packed. I came to say goodbye to you. Time is boundless, I'll come to visit when I'm free. Fengju didn't know what was going on. Are you still sleeping or am I still sleeping? The carrot swiftly zoomed toward Fengju but stopped three paces short of reaching her. I can't come any closer to you. The thing is, his voice suddenly rose high as he begged to her, Don't go back to sleep, listen to me first. Fengju listened haphazardly, and as it turned out, everything hadn't been a dream. In Xiao Yan's words, he got lost last night halfway into his exploration. By the time he returned, Fengju was nowhere to be found. He worriedly searched for her through the night without any result. When he tiredly came back to Jai Feng Yuan, he was surprised to find a little scarlet fox sleeping soundly on her bed. His sworn enemy Donghua Daijun was sitting in a trance watching the sleeping fox. Such a trance it was, he didn't even notice Xiao Yan had come near. Xiao Yan had thought it rather peculiar, so when Donghua had briefly left the room, he'd taken his chance to sneak in. At this point, Xiao Yan became somewhat emotional. He said he didn't know the scarlet fox on the bed was Fengju. He thought it was a new rare animal Donghua had captured on a hunt. It was so adorable that he couldn't help himself and went to cuddle the animal. That was when tragedy fell. Fengju took a look at the carrot's bandaged hand which resembled a pig trotter and laughed, Did I breathe a fireball and burn your hand in my sleep? I told you I'm pretty wicked. No, not at all, the carrot told her. Ice face came out of nowhere and stood leaning against the doorway. I hadn't time to react by the time my hands were already turned into this. I couldn't hold you anymore because of my condition so I dropped you back onto the bed. But surprisingly you didn't wake from the drop at all. Then I woefully discovered that I couldn't come any closer than three paces from your bed. I was going to retaliate when Ice Face suddenly asked me if I'm living with you, and for how long have we lived together? Fengju scratched her head and explained to the carrot, it's like this. On cold days when I fall asleep, I'd unconsciously turn back into my original form. In that form, I don't feel cold and it's easier to sleep. But what did Daijun mean? I don't know either. But basically I don't remember for how long we've lived at this place. Because I don't remember, I told him six months or thereabout. I was occupied with trying to recall the exact length of time we've lived together so I didn't pay attention to him. By the time I turned around, he had used the paralysis spell on me. He frowned and looked at me for a long time, then out of nowhere said he liked me. Fengju fell over and slammed her head against the bed frame. The person who still hadn't realized he had uttered a lethal incomplete sentence went on to complain, out of nowhere said he liked my garden house. Then he stopped and looked at Fengju in surprise. How did you bump your head? Doesn't it hurt? Whoa, what a big bun. Fengju waved her hands to signal for him to continue. Xiao Yan concernedly went on, massage that bun. You have to rub it so blood doesn't clot there. Oh, the fact that he likes my living arrangements? That's it. That's it. 
He said our residence is closer to the school while his is too far from it. Ours has a fishing pond while his doesn't. Ours has you who can cook while his doesn't. So he wants to trade places with me. Since I'm the obliging selfless type, I agreed. I'm here to say goodbye after packing my things. Even though I'll miss you, don't we immortals derive happiness from helping others? Feng Ju was honest in her reply. I have indeed heard a fairy derives happiness from helping others, but I've never heard a demon derives happiness from the same thing. She paused. You easily traded places. With Dai Jun because you know ever since he arrived at Fanyan Gu, the Bianiao queen especially instructed Jai Hun to serve him at his place. Isn't that your true motive? The giant carrot couldn't hide his amazement for Feng Ju. He rubbed his nose. This, okay, you're right. If I succeed, I'll invite you to our wedding as a special guest. He thought a bit more and added, and I won't ask for congratulatory money either. Feng Ju's head started to ache. She waved her hand. All right, I understand everything now. Since we failed this time, I'll move our date to the 15th of next month. You'll come, right? Xiao Yan nodded as he went to the door. Then he abruptly turned his head and solemnly said, There's something else. I'm very sorry to have taken advantage and held you in your original form. As friends, I should never take advantage of you in such situation. When you want, just say the word and I'll let you take advantage of me back. Feng Ju massaged her bump. No need. Xiao Yan insisted on compensating his good sister. He gently told her in all seriousness, You don't have to be mindful of me. If I took advantage of you, then just take it right back. My memory is bad, if I forget in one or two days, you'd be losing out. Hey, maybe you should take advantage of me twice. We should count interest for the time which had passed. Leave. Outside the winder under the morning light was a vast haziness. Feng Ju hugged her quilt tightly as she sat absent-mindedly for a while. She saw out the window in the snow a Japanese cinnamon tree sticking out oddly with its radiating green color. She couldn't help but linger her eyes on it a while longer. Snow descended in Fanyan Valley all four seasons. Occasionally when there was a clear sky, the snowy scenery still looked nebulous in the sunlight. After half a year of looking at this landscape, Feng Ju fairly missed the turbulent world outside. Meng Xiao told her that more than 200 years ago, Fanyan Valley had also once had four different seasons. This year-round snowfall was only a recent phenomenon of the recent 200 years. And if they were to speak of this phenomenon, they'd have to speak of the Bianiao clan's famous archmage Chen Ye who had sought seclusion for many years past. It was said this archmage for reasons unknown had locked himself at home one day, placed the three seasons into his sword, and stored it away inside his sleeve. He had not left his residence in the many years henceforth. Ever since, Fanyan Valley was deprived of spring, summer, and fall. Meng Xiao vaguely mentioned that Chen Yi's action was to mourn the departure of Arania. After she left, the queen forbade the mentioning of her name in the kingdom. Some had said when Arania was still among them, she was especially fond of spring, summer, and fall as they were full of life. When Chen Ye took those three seasons away, he wanted to remind the entire kingdom that even without uttering the name Arania again, they would never be able to forget her. After barely a few words, 
Meng Xiao suddenly shushed up as if he was saying what he wasn't supposed to. Enjoying her wine, Feng Zhu had been listening with delight and was curious as to what sort of person Arania was, but no matter what, Meng Xiao would not continue and she didn't ask any further. At this time as she watched the bleak whiteness outside, Feng Zhu suddenly recalled the story she had heard six months ago. But today, Feng Zhu was no longer interested in the ups and downs of Chen Ye and Arania's tale. She only felt a sense of loss. Had the cold winter been Arania's favorite season that year, the valley would be able to keep spring, summer, and fall, and everyone wouldn't have to suffer through this. Someone sneezed at this point in her train of thoughts. She looked up and detected a corner of purple fabric among the desolate snowfall. Stunned for a moment, Feng Ju craned her neck and stared past the Japanese cinnamon beyond the window panes. Dong Hua was sitting across from the fishing pond by himself. He sat on a broken folding chair made of jujube wood, and Feng Ju was amazed at how he could remain looking so regal. How befitting for a king! But in her memory, he used to recline in the sun or entertain himself with a couple of sutras whenever he went fishing in the past. This time, however, he was gazing deep into the water surface as if his entire soul was placed into that fishing rod. Feng Zhu admired him from afar. He had seemed to be preoccupied. Even his pensive look, objectively, was devastatingly gorgeous. Why did the king suddenly want to trade sleeping quarters with Yan Chai Wu? What did Xiao Yan say a second ago? Did he say the king thought Jai Feng Yuan was closer to the school, had good scenery, had a fishing pond, and a good cook? If Xiao Yan hadn't reminded her beforehand, she might have believed Dai Jun's rubbish this time. Luckily, Xiao Yan had forewarned her. These were merely the long-winded turns in love. She furrowed her brow. Was this another tactic used to upset Jai Hun? Dong Hua agreed for Jai Hun and Xiao Yan to be friends, but he must have been bothered when they really became close. The first time Dong Hua saved her and brought her back to his bed had been his first retaliation against Jai Hun. Unfortunately, she had ruined it for him. During Miao Luo's eradication, Jai Hun was also present. Dong Hua had tried to upset her again, but she had ran away in jealousy. Dong Hua had seemed to be pleased with this, because after Jai Hun ran away and she stayed to help him, he had seemed to be in a good mood when she later helped him fall asleep. Then, Switching residences with Xiao Yan must be the third act of the play. When Jai Hun couldn't take it anymore and came to him full of tears, he'd whip out a marriage license and the two would be reconciled. By then, even if Siming had carved Jai Hun and Xiao Yan's destiny in stone, the pair of them would never be able to work. After Feng Zhu recognized these intricacies, she suddenly realized Dai Jun was too complicated a person. At the same time, she really was becoming wiser these days for her to be able to see such complexities. But after praising herself, she felt an inexplicable paralysis, a deep sense of emptiness followed. In her mind, Dong Hua was in fact very dedicated when Jai Hun was concerned. Drafty wind entered through the window cracks. After a sneeze, she remembered there was a cloak on the side of the bed. She draped it over her shoulders and stepped down from her bed. A murmur suddenly sounded from the other side, if Zonglin was here, the tea would be brewed already. Feng Ju looked in surprise in the direction of this voice. There Dong Hua was opening the cover and looking inside the empty teapot. She had no idea when he had entered her room, 
but it certainly took some mental fortitude in order to casually waltz into someone else's room like this. She watched him for half a day. After going through the Miao Luo incident, she had wanted to distance herself from him, but she couldn't find that distant feeling even for half a second. Her words hadn't come forth when she choked them back. Then why didn't you bring Zonglin when you came to the valley? Dong Hua set the empty teapot down. Why should I bring him when you're here? Feng Ju pressed down on the bulging veins on her temple. Why can't you bring him if I'm here? I can't trouble you if he's here, he answered ever so naturally. Feng Ju wanted to retort, so without him you'd have no qualms bothering me, but in her hastiness, it got changed to, why will you have any qualms bothering me if he comes? Dong Hua looked at her and nodded. You're right. I can still bother you even if he's here. He lifted the fish creel on the table and smoothly handed it to her. Will you make some food? After a length of time, Feng Ju finally realized what she said and what Dong Hua said in reply. A massive migraine kicked in. She massaged her temple and looked into the basket. I feel that you're too thick-skinned sometimes. The king's face remained utterly tranquil. Your feelings are very accurate. He pushed the creel toward her again. Steam this. All right. She looked inside the basket. A crucian carp suddenly jumped up, but hit the opening and fell back down. She swiftly backed away. You mean, kill it? Dong Hua glanced at the fish that was jumping inside the basket. Do I look like I want you to free it? I thought immortals from Jukongtian don't kill, Feng Ju lamented. You've misunderstood us too much. When he received no response from her, he quietly gazed to the distance. Then he suddenly said, I still vaguely remember the other night you said on the 15th of next month. Feng Ju jolted, her sleepiness instantly dissipated away. She interrupted Dong Hua, No, no, you've confused it with your dreams. I didn't say anything and you didn't hear anything. Feng Ju saw the secret in Dong Hua's eyes. She looked down to the bamboo creel in her hands and hastily said, It's certainly an honor to cook for your majesty. I've always wanted to cook for you but I never had the chance. How would you like your steamed fish? It's important to know there are many ways to steam a fish. Should I make peony blossom cuts on the fish, or the thinner magnolia slices? Then fill the cuts with shiitake mushrooms and steam it. Or if you like shiitakes, I can stuff them directly into the fish. In the past when they lived in Taichan Palace, she had nothing to compete with Jihan. Truthfully, she had always wanted to display her cooking skill but never had the chance to. The carp inside thrashed about and caused the basket to slip from Yang Ju's hand. Luckily, Dong Hua grabbed it in time. Chill pricked her hand as she realized he was holding it. His voice sounded above her head, Have you got it? He paused, then said, Make the first dish today, the second tomorrow, then maybe one with garlic sauce the day after. Why are you thinking so far ahead, Feng Ju thought. Her gaze landed on Dong Hua's wrist and saw that his sleeve was stained with blood. She held onto the creel and nodded her chin towards him. What's wrong with your hand? Dong Hua's eyes flickered, he didn't seem to think that she would notice this. He gently replied, My wound reopened when I carried you home. Then he proceeded to study her face. You're being absurd, I'm not that heavy. Feng Ju protested. 
Dai Jun remained quiet for a second, then told her, I think what you should be concerned about is my injured hand, not your body weight. With the fish creel in her hand, she stepped in for a closer look. Oh, then why is your hand so weak? Because you're too heavy. Feng Ju's temper flared. But that's absurd, when am I ever heavy? This sounded exceptionally familiar, as if she was circling back to the previous argument. While she was busy mulling over this, Dong Hua suddenly raised his hand. She quickly ducked to the side. I never raise my hand when I lose an argument against you. So when you lose an argument against me, you can't raise your hand either. His hand lowered and dropped onto her head. Her hair follicles pricked where his hand was. Placed. The room suddenly went still. They could even hear the sound of snow falling to the ground from the Japanese cinnamon tree. Her entire being fell into confusion. What opera was Dai Jun reenacting now? She carefully lifted her eyes and caught his calm patient gaze. There's a tangled lock. Xiao Bai, didn't you comb your hair when you woke up? The conversation veered too quickly. This was the second time he called her Xiao Bai. Feng Ju's face reddened as she stammered, Why, you, don't know anything. It's the fashion this year. She took the fish basket and fled the room. Thick snow blanketed the vast courtyard. Feng Ju touched her burning face as she ran and wondered why she should blush and stammer. It couldn't be because Dong Hua called her Xiao Bai, could it? Was it because she wasn't happy with her name and liked the way Dong Hua called her? She was too sentimental and soft-hearted, she decided. What was she going to do when people take advantage of her? End of Chapter 10